suddenly this anger has room, has a body in which it can erupt. It has hands and a mouth and hair and, 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 and I, Ellen, in that moment, or you, Michael, are familiar, familiar enough with that wave of, of energy to, to trust it and not to contract against it or spiritualize it away or conceptualize it away, but rather just ride it like a wave, like surfing these emotions, because emotions are like waves. Welcome back to The Sounds of Sand, presented by Science and Non-Duality. My name is Michael Riley McDermott. And today I had the privilege to speak with teacher and writer Ellen Emmett. And Ellen offers meetings and retreats at the Awakening Body, which is a direct exploration of experience sourced in the non-dual traditions of Kashmir Shaivism, authentic movement, and self-inquiry. And she's also a psychotherapist with a Jungian orientation, and we'll speak a little bit about the Jungian shadow and how that manifests in spirituality, as well as embodiment and devotion, among other topics. So it's a beautiful conversation, and I'm delighted you're here to share with us here on The Sounds of Sand. So if you're ready to explore together, I'll meet you on the other side. Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. Ellen, thank you for joining us here on Sounds of Sand podcast. It's wonderful to spend some time with you. Nice to see you, yeah. Michael. So one theme that seems to be emerging in these podcast conversations, which is interesting because of the, uh, the, the format of, of audio only having the conversation, is listening. And the theme of yeah. listening seems to be coming back, and, and you know it's such a broad topic. And I've heard you use the word listening a lot in, in talks that I've watched and, and articles and things of that nature. So I just wonder if we could start with listening and a space of listening. I love that. That's really nice, Michael. I mean, you know, I guess these podcasts don't have a visual, so mm -hmm. people who are listening, if we go quiet, you know, they might, go, they might get nervous. So, you know, what's going on? What? But actually to embed this listening this 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 experience of listening in a podcast is is so lovely because it's i don't know it's uh for me i mean and i know that you also feel quite strongly about whatever it is that we mean by listening maybe we need maybe i should say what i how i understand that word you know in a way i think i, I listening is Listening is sort of settling in into my true nature. Uh, it's hard not to have to, you know, I hate having to use spiritual words, but listening would be to settle in a space that is as open as possible. And I guess as you, as you settle there, the, the openness relaxes and relaxes and becomes increasingly open, you could say. So listening is, is really, in a way, meditation. It's about being available being available moment by moment to our experience, um, yeah. and our experience including you know thoughts and feelings and emotions and whatever is arising. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for for me, listening is almost it's uh, is almost my spiritual practice. You know, just yes, as a meditation practice, but also it's something that. Uh, I endeavor to do, you know, almost 24 hours a day, <laughs> listening in relation to people, listening in uh, dreams, listening internally, externally. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think me too, in a way. And um, and and to begin with, um, 
you know, I mean, because when you hear the word listening, you think listening with the ears and you, and you think listening to something, you know, listening to a piece of music or, mm -hmm. but I, I guess what we're talking about is uh, a listening that to begin with might be directed towards, towards some things, uh, you know, like an inner experience or an outer ex experience. But at some point it's as if listening starts to listen to itself. Mm -hmm. You know, or, or, or perhaps whatever it is that is being listened to and the listening recognize each other so intimately connected. So, so listening is, is, is a, a word that has a very powerful, is pointing to something very powerful, which has other words, I think, in other traditions, which, yeah. I, you know, I think it is our true nature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but what's nice about that word is that it doesn't sort of transcend experience because it's still saying also listening to something or mm. someone or some something that is not yet fully known. So in order for that thing, whatever it may be, to become known, this beautiful nonviolent attitude of of being available. Um, yeah, it's you know. I, Maybe a, a similar word is consciousness, um, but like you said, mm -hmm. listening has this flavor of relationality to it, because yeah, yes, you can of course listen to listening itself, and sort of just like you can direct conscious, you can develop consciousness of consciousness itself. Yes. But as a moment-to-moment -moment experience, it's almost a, a surrendering to the invisible, because listening is always at that edge of of the moment of, of creation. Um, yes, you know. exactly. And, and not knowing and, and, you know, in true listening, and of course, usually when we adopt this intention of listening, we have to face the, the one who, to begin with, we listen with an agenda. Mm -hmm. For example, let's say there's a, an emotional state and I'm listening well, the first thing I may encounter is that I want to get rid of this thing or I want this to this to relax or, you know, there, there, there'll be many layers to this listening. Um, but, but the listening that I guess we're sort of evoking is a, a nonviolent listening, a, a listening that, that doesn't want anything mm -hmm. from whatever it is, whatever is being listened, um, which is a quite a tall order. I mean... We usually do want something, and that's very human. And yes, yeah, so it's that sort of dance between, you know, full re receptivity, sort of free of any agenda, and the honesty of actually seeing our agendas and our our limit, our the limit to our listening, which is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And then, as we see that limit, it dissolves and relaxes, and. Yeah, this the idea of listening without an agenda. You know, I, you know, so much of our listening and our ability to be attentive and aware it comes from our evolution for survival as a species. And you know, we're, we're hardwired when we hear a sound. You know, if something wakes us up in the middle of the night, we need to say, "Okay, is that dangerous? Is that a threat to me? Was that just the cat knocking a glass yeah. over, <laughs> or is that someone smashing in my front window?" And um, you know, it, I guess it's one of the privileges of being able to explore these things in, in, in a, a, a spiritual context or contemplative context that we can actually get back to a more safe, um, inviting listening and exploratory listening. Yes, 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 mm. yes, yes. But I guess, you know, if the feeling of not safe is mm -hmm. here, then that can be listened to, such as it is, yeah. you know. That everything is uh, here to be listened to. You know, the cacophony of experience, not wanting to qu to quickly. Sometimes in the spiritual circles, there can be a, a little bit. We're a little bit in a hurry to spiritualize things or to purify things of of, of their so-called egoic content or personal. You know, we're not supposed to be pe persons. You know, sometimes there's this sort of. So what I like about this sort of, this word listening and also not knowing is that. There isn't a rush to get anywhere. It's more a, an availability to what is, and it, it includes a tactile or sensual receptivity, not just 
not conceptual only because since we don't know, let's say you, the cat knocks over the glass and it makes a noise, but I don't know it's the cat, and I feel the fear and the adrenaline in my body, well, to begin with, uh, this, this moment where there's no concepts, or all sorts of concepts come in, is it the cat, is it the burglar, is it, but then to be with the raw, the raw experience more and more. Yeah. And postpone and postpone the labels and the. Mm. Yeah, and I, a word when you said you know there's this rush to spiritualize everything. Um, I think of this as you know to make everything precious, to make everything like a you know to not like you said not be with the experience, but to to put it in this you know <laughs> like a. I don't know, the yogi tea bag when they have like the little sayings on there. And so every difficult experience needs to be a teachable moment that you can put into context of some lineage or, you know, and it's, it's just, right. it's just a way of, of co coming out of the, of the present moment. And I know so much of your work with embodiment and your writings, a recent article you posted on sand is, is so much about being with the difficulty, being with the, with the darkness. And, um, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I mean, I cause I think I've developed this sort of radar for the spiritual bypass mm. that is quite prevalent, and and you know, I I think we're all guilty mm. of it because it's because we because we have a very sincere desire for the absolute, but I think I I'm more and more sort of on the high vigil for for that. Um, yeah. Um, because it's it's a violence in a way, you know, to be too quick to, to to try to spiritualize something. But for example, this idea that when in meditation, when there's a resistance, you welcome the resistance and it returns to the source, to awareness. Well, in principle, that's true, but in practice, it, it's not always such a direct path. And in fact, the resistance. It may be here for a reason, may have an intelligence, may be important to linger with, uh, may may need some time to speak. To, you know, if it's, it could be anything. Let's say it's a, a feeling of, let's say it's a feeling of jealousy, you know. And in meditation, okay, jealousy, I take the label away and all I do is I welcome it. It's a raw experience and off it goes back to awareness. I think, I think... I more and more feel like, no, give jealousy a chance to speak first as jealousy and recognize that there's a jealous one here. That, and just spend a bit of time there, maybe having a conversation or seeing what the situation is pointing to and uh, listening. So it's still a listening and an openness, but it's it's taking seriously the content of experience. It's not too quick to want to sort of clean it away or sp spiritualize it away. Um, on the other hand, I think it is a, important not to get lost in feelings, you know, not to, not to use a feeling to validate, you know, a position that is entrenched. So, so it's, it's, it's not an easy dance to find. And sometimes in spiritual circles, we can make it sound so simple because there's nobody there and, you know, and every, everything is made out of awareness. So, so just welcome. It, it's, it sometimes pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like... That one you can I feel like this is something at sand that we're we're talking about and addressing um you know the the idea of spiritual bypassing and um yeah just developing the compassionate wisdom of ourselves of of finding that balance and that dance because sometimes you do you just have to go too far in the direction of wallowing in your jealousy to where you know maybe you're depressed for a few days and you're like okay I think I've I think I've gone too far into identifying with the story. I need to maybe reorient back towards the sense of absolute um, or vice versa, where like you said, you just, you, you're not ever experiencing the directness of, of the pain, you know, the shared, and it's a shared pain. It's, it's not always my own 
personal struggle, you know, it's, it's in relation to others and it's, it's universal, you know, it's. Yes. Or a field, if it's in a relationship, mm -hmm. it's, or even if it's, if it's in the field of your own psyche, you're not on your own in your own psyche. You right. know, our psyche is a democracy. There's mm -hmm. Ellen or Michael, but yeah. we're just sort of the, the sort of headquarters thinking we know everything. Meanwhile, we just have to look at our dreams and look at all the characters and creatures and landscapes in our dreams to know that our psyches are, are amazingly rich and unpredictable and unknown. You know, the, 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 the shady character in your dream or the weird looking creature or the... Th those are those are you. Those are you, yeah. and they are somehow coming to be, to be uh, I don't know what to be a, to be welcomed, to be to be dialogued with. To to they have something to say, and we don't know what that is. Um, but if we're too quick to go back to the ocean, the ocean being awareness, uh, we we sort of step over a, a very rich realm of, of the human psyche which which we need I, th I feel we need to attend to because that's what makes us f sort of whole humans you know humans who have done their work their shadow work and therefore can maybe or I don't know what they can do but doing your shadow work or your inner work has a profound effect on the on your on your field it's uh, it takes care of, of, of it's 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 like our civic duty. I feel, mm -hmm. you know, it feels like we all share a sh the shadow is universal, but we all have a corner of shadow, and if we can take care of that, well, we're doing our bit, and and also we'll be a bit less judgmental about the others yeah. and their shadow, and or maybe we'll know how to invite others to not be afraid and not not feel they have to be perfect and spiritual and <laughs> it's got it's got nothing to, it's got nothing to do you know spirituality has got nothing to do with being a perfect human being these characters it you know something that comes to mind is like it, when we um, experience fiction whether it's a you know a film or a book we love the bad the bad guys and we love the drama and the, the shadowy dark people it's what makes the story interesting if it was all just nice friendly people sitting around you know not doing anything exactly. there would be no dramatic tension but for some reason in ourselves we we were afraid maybe maybe it's just a fear of 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 witnessing. I and think so. I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a fear of not, uh, because the ego isn't in control, but, it, but the illusion that it is in control is very, very, very convincing. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, but if we, so as long as we have, as, if we start to make a connection with this so-called unconscious, which is the realm of all these other parts of ourself, I think then very quickly we, we, we fall in love with that because it's a relief to realize that there's so much more riches to our lives and that the ego isn't in charge. The ego has an important role to play as a sort of mediation with the unconscious, but it, it becomes much more interesting because you start to identify the themes in your psyche and your, in your own sort of individual myth. Uh, we all have, you could say, we're all like little characters, yeah, like you said, like characters in our own... Uh, little myth, but of course all interconnected with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, what am I trying to say? I don't know. I got lost. But you, I liked what you said. It's much more interesting that way. If we were, how boring would it be if all, <laughs> or how boring it is when you feel like you have to be like sort of aligned with awareness twenty four seven. That doesn't mean anything. It's yeah. uh, um, <laughs> awareness. Uh, Awareness, I don't know. Awareness is a wearing all by itself and, 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 and enjoying playing with itself yeah. clearly. And we're a part of that. Yeah, it's, it's like awareness still has a, 
I guess, still has a, a, a thirst for a quality of diversity in the experience of itself. Uh, I, I remember Clearly. when I when I was first kind of you know uh, you know doing meditation and and seeing teachers and meeting with people who have been doing this for a while. There was part of me that was worried that the the path towards awakening or whatever whatever you want to call it would kind of rob me of my of my personhood and there wouldn't be room you know I would become like this you know enlightened robot who didn't feel anything who was just you know <laughs> walking around. But the, you know when yeah. I I've you know, if I watch videos or hear, you know, in, in people who uh, may be closer to enlightenment or awakening, they still have this this radiant light of the personal in their in their you know in their laugh and the, the way oh. that they talk about things, you know, their interests. It, so that to me is comforting. That you know, even as we maybe are on a quest towards a, a unity consciousness, there's still this um, the shining of the personal. Yeah, in a there. way, yeah. And maybe even more so, the, the, the essence of each one can shine brighter and uh, brighter and brighter, like truer. You could say you, you become more you, what, what God meant you to be, maybe. And it, it doesn't mean that if we have, I mean, I know for myself sometimes I do like to do self-inquiry and, 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 and adopt that direct path, you know, where I might see that I'm, uh, in a sort of contraction of, of of the me of the separate self, and it's very intense. And I might I might take myself, you know, I might question in that moment. I might uh, who that one is and where is that one, and, and and really bring myself back to the to the to the no, to the knowledge, the direct experience that, that there is no such separate one. But. But it doesn't mean that I'm then sweep away whatever was here, like whatever the situation is in my life or the great sadness that might be here that then triggered a contraction around me. I need to s s sort of protect myself and make sure I stay safe. And so that I question. But having questioned that, still the sadness, still maybe whatever, anger. And, and, and then I can tend to that. I can... I don't know, be interested, curious, not have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. I think that's maybe what sometimes can be misleading in the spiritual traditions, some, where everything seems to be a certainty. Mm. And all you need is a formulation, and that's then, then you're good. Well, uh, I think it's good to also put those formulations uh, in the... In the fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Perhaps even maybe in the spiritual circles, there should be more. Um, I don't know if advertising is the right word, but <laughs> more um, openly saying, "I don't know. I don't know. We don't know." And and to rest in that "I don't know" place as as some sort of refuge from our polarized society that seems to have an answer for everything and you know is able to put you into a category of you know left or right or up and down and this is your identity to embrace the the um you know all of this well that's yeah. yeah sorry no no i was gonna say just embrace all of the the uncertainty that we're living in the impermanence of you know environmental collapse and polarization and war and all of this stuff it's just like this is this is the, our collective karma you know this is just this is the path that we're on together yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, I was, there's two things I wanted to say. Um, well, two, two, sort of two, re, two, two levels. Like the I don't know in meditation, the I don't know is actually the true, the true position. Like from the, from the point of view of awareness, there is no conceptual knowledge. There's, and, and so if I or you, and I, you or I are sitting and contemplating or listening to our experience... All we can know is what we think we know. And, and, and that will give us the sort of geography of our, of our sort of pole, the position we have. Like, all we can know is what, what we think in the moment or what we feel and how we label that. And that gives us an idea of how we function, how, what our defenses are, what our 
assertions are. And I mean, of course, sometimes we, we also feel love or openness and it's a feeling and it's also a form of knowledge that is a sort of intuition of, our, of, of something that's not a pole. It's more like a flavor of our true nature, you could say. So that's in meditation. But then in life, as you say, it's like, and more and more, this polar polarization of everything, right? So, so, so what? So to see that, to be, to be really aware that, to take, not to adopt, if there's, if you're in one position, explore the other, you know, go, go there with your, with your with your felt sense, explore what the other side is, because it's 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 your shadow. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that at some point we can't have an opinion or take action and have an idea about something. But, but I mean, we're in such a rush, like the whole COVID thing. And now I you, I don't know if you've been listening to the Harry and Meghan and the monarchy versus the. Mm -hmm. California, you know, the, 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 it's very interesting in, in England mm -hmm. to watch like how quickly everybody needs to tell you which camp they're in. Okay. <laughs> they're either sort of on the monarchy side or they're on Harry's side. Mm -hmm. Harry being the prince yeah. who has gone off to California and is exploring his feelings. And anyway, and, and I'm thinking, well, can't, so in my sort of, but this is my opinion, like these two poles are shadows of each other and they obviously need to deliver medicine to each other but mm -hmm. how to do that how to facilitate that and yeah, yeah anyway yeah just I, I i don't know that particular story but i i know that pattern everywhere it's like everyone's yes. got their <laughs> version of what the facts are and they're very happy to tell you about it uh, in a very you yeah. know yeah i mean we, we saw that a lot with COVID. Yeah. you know everyone every every few months the the you know the the narrative of what was true and what was safe and what was unsafe and what you had to do and what your responsibility was was changing and i think as a as a society maybe we were just hungry for someone to go on tv and say look we don't know we're scared too this is a plague it's a global plague we don't know what's going to happen we don't know how it's transmitted you know we don't know if it's ever going to go away we don't know we're like you we just don't know and i think the fact that we never Receive that from people in, in power just created this these layer, le, layers and levels of distrust, you know, that we're still so, still seeing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of fear, a lot of fear, yeah. and then, yeah, I think it's probably true that our culture has lost its capacity to not know. Mm -hmm. You know, I think maybe <laughs> in traditional cultures there were many rituals or ways that people would would reconnect with the mystery and also you know give it over to the gods you know really literally they knew that they knew they didn't know and they had rituals and they also had these archetypal figures you know these gods and goddesses that held these various archetypes um anyways but we we don't have that anymore we concretize that we make it very literal and then so when a, a something like COVID comes, it becomes very concrete. It's, it's, we project all our shadow on it. We don't, we don't have any, any, any way to question what it might be reflecting back to us. I mean, I do think people did reflect quite a lot during COVID mm -hmm. in pockets. But if we look at the overall mainstream media, it was pretty pathetic. <laughs> it continues to be very, very polarized and driven by fear and greed yeah. and um, but I guess I, I, I hope I hope that there are enough pockets of people who do know that whatever a phenomenon like that is a real mirror into our psyche into our collective psyche a real wake up call and then of course the question is well what is what is it waking us up to and what are the questions we need to ask ourselves and how do we ask these questions to with 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 each other and could we not be in such a rush to have answers to questions yeah but to look yeah yeah there was almost this mantra of you know returning to normal returning to normal 
And I think many of us just know there was no normal and what we thought was normal was actually quite abnormal. <laughs> yes. You know. Yeah, it was such a, a a breath of fresh air to begin with. I know there was lots of horror, yeah. you know, lots of death and sickness and but there was something about that first lockdown that was that carried something too. And I guess the fact that it was a pandemic that we knew everybody somehow there was a global everybody was in it mm. in it together although although you know what i'm not sure that's true you know, it was a big in our corner of the world but in other corners of the world it was where war and famine and other terrible things are going on i'm not sure it was on the foreground on the forefront of their experience so who knows So something that speaks to me so much in what you offer is the relationship to the body, you know, and to our collective bodies. Um, and it, as you write on your, in your website, in our daily lives, the body is seldom tasted as it is. We rarely listen to its language or allow it to simply unfold and blossom in its natural, original intelligence. And so I, this resonates for me and I think for a lot of people because in our you know, Western world of, of so much media saturation and there's a real primacy and an elevation of thought and intellectual mm -hmm. property and, and you know, things happening in the brain. You know, we have this current um, obsession with artificial intelligence, with chat GPT and all this mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And uh, so many times the body just feels like it gets lost, like it has no role in, uh, in our collective growth as, as a culture. So I was just wondering if you could talk more about this concept of the awakening body and your work with embodiment. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, I, I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, oh, it's so difficult to talk about that aspect because well, precisely because it isn't in the realm of concepts, mm -hmm. but yet I'm sure there's a way to language something to do with the realm of the body that isn't that doesn't invite our listeners, your listeners, into their heads. And well, for example, right now, all of us, you and me, Michael, and whoever is listening to this, are sitting or standing or whatever. But you know, obviously, are are having are experiencing and tasting a tactile sensation, textures, temperatures, tingling, you know, so it's just always there, the body. It's, 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 it's a mystery. You know, I don't, if somebody asked me to define what is the body, I would not know how to define it. I, I think, I think I tend to feel when I guide people that what I mean by the body is life in a way. And of course, life includes thoughts so perhaps I, I when I speak about the awakening body I actually include thoughts but they would be th they wouldn't be they wouldn't have been extracted out from the totality they would be part of the sort of unfolding um, and of course I also mean and I'm sure we also mean by the body the the realm of of energy, of sensuality, of touch, of like when I speak, my voice, it's delivering concepts, but it has a, it has a caressing felt sense that conveys something to your animal body that doesn't need to be conceived of. It's, that, you know, there's a sort of, there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a realm, it's a field. And, and when we listen to that, in, in in sessions or it's as if it put us in it puts us in contact when we listen to the realm of tactility and sensation and touch and temperature and textures and and tension and pulsation and you know all sorts and not just not just the good stuff but the whole range 
it it connects us with the field that extends beyond the body, which is mysterious, which is I want to call it vibrational. It's uh, we 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 come to know directly without having to go through a concept. We come to know that a body, there is no such thing as an isolated body, mm. your body or my body, is, and that we come to know that directly, that there's sort of v sensations and experience that are, 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 are flowing in a sort of field of vibration, and we, we can touch that sometimes. Mm. And, um, you know, that's... Well, in a, in, a, in a certain way, it's very simple, and it is our, it's, it's as it should be, because it's the mm. truth. <laughs> it's nothing yeah. fancy. But because, as you say, our culture is, the, is, 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 so, is so keen on thinking and <laughs> so, so big on, 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 <laughs> on, on, on thinking, yeah, mm. on, it's a relief when we come down, when we take the elevator down from up there, mm. uh, from the mm. headquarters up there, and... <laughs> Um, and it's also something about the animal the body, you know, the creature, the earth, the feet, the belly, the breath, the sexual centers, the, something about the wilderness of the body that we've so lost touch with. At least I, I, I did. I don't know, maybe it's not true of everyone, but uh, that's what was so appealing to me when I met people who were redeeming that. No, I think I think it is. I can see you. Talking, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I have the I had the a same same thing of just not even realizing my that I had a body, you know, until until I was in my mid thirties and I was working with a therapist with some things, and he said, you know, where do you feel that in your body? And at first, I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, where does where do you feel that in your body? And it just took a while, but eventually, I started to yeah notice that you know simple things like where does excitement what does excitement feel like in the body where, what does fear feel like in the body um, and then slowly you know the ice it felt like ice started to melt and I think mm. so many people feel that numbness somehow you know I don't know what it is if yes. where we where we learned it if it's uh, just our culture or what but um, yeah do, well I think do, do you, have, you know the trauma the yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, exactly. It was, continue. It, well, well, the word trauma is being used, used a lot, and we really, since for the past two, three years, trauma, suddenly trauma, trauma, trauma. And mm -hmm. I think it's good, and yet sometimes I feel like let's not be traumatized by our trauma. <laughs> you know? let's, let's take it also with a grain of salt. Like Otherwise, people have so many ideas now about how to meet trauma, and I have to admit sometimes I... I get clients who are saying yes because the neural pathway is this, and if I do da da da, and if I and I think yes, but let's erase all those ideas and just be here. Like, just don't be afraid of your trauma. You, you won't anyway. That's another topic in a way. But the the reason why we're numb is is valid, you know, in a way, if we're, we're tiny infants or t small children or and, and if there's uh, abuse or or if we're in a country where there's war or, um, you know, some violence, there is going to be a trace in the body. Uh, uh, and if especially if it's repeated, there will be a habit, a pathway of defense, defending. And that, I guess, that married to the conditioned belief that we are separate selves, that Therefore, we're, we, I, as a separate self, am responsible for my, for my security, for my safety, for my well-being. It, you know, we keep rehearsing all sorts of different things that that give us the illusion, first of all, of being separate, and second of all, of being a safe separate self, a separate self who is safe. Mm -hmm. So there's a point in our spiritual journey or in our psychological journey where we have to challenge that belief. You know, we have to be, as you said, when you describe your therapist invited you to feel where is your fear and not just where it was, but then to really taste it. Yeah. And at that, and there, it was a journey. I'm sure there was a bit of, it was a back and forth, numbness, a bit of, uh, and then off in your head and back, you know, it's, it's not, it's not necessarily a straightforward journey. It's like making friends with a creature again. Yeah. And I, 
and also not having too many ideas about any of it. Y yeah, like let's fear. Fear is here. Oh, okay. Where is it? Here. It's in my. It's in my throat and in my solar plexus. Okay. And then maybe. Okay, how does it move? What temperature? What color? But then, and then take the label fear away and just take the label body away, take the label Ellen away and just, just be. And then again, another time with another, so, so not having a big old agenda about I'm going to understand what fear is or anger is or the body is. Uh, no, let's not have no, none of those agendas. More like, <laughs> you know what? I don't even know what I'm talking about, Michael, which is, is I like that. It's like, I don't really know yeah. what these sessions are, what the body is or... I don't know. Honestly, I don't. Yeah, it's, a, it's I mean, you know, we, we think about the body, I guess, in a biological context, usually, like, as, like you said, an external organism yes. that has a boundary to it. <laughs> but our felt experience of the body is so amorphous. It's, it's you know, yes. it's this collection of sensations and perceptions and yes. you know, senses and... But, but but suddenly, like it's amorphous, and sometimes when we listen to it, and we are in, we're we're tuning into the field in which it appears, and it's amorphous, and then suddenly, at another moment, the angry Michael or angry Ellen constellates, mm -hmm. or whatever, and then there is someone, there is a body with a right. shape and an age and a story and a feeling, and here, if we've done our ex if we've if we've come back in touch with the body and have been interested in suddenly this anger has room, has a body in which it can erupt. It has hands and a mouth and hair. And, 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 and I, Ellen, in that moment, or you, Michael, are familiar, familiar enough with that wave of, of energy to, to trust it and not to contract mm -hmm. against it or spiritualize it away or conceptualize it away, but rather just ride it like a wave, like surfing these emotions, because emotions are like waves. I mean, they have a, a trajectory, mm -hmm. and, and that can be very creative. It, in fact, it is pure creativity, mm -hmm. because emotions, if we think about it, feelings, emotions, they are the way life creates. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so that's also a, a whole a very interesting exploration, you know, to to learn to dance with feelings where they're not serving the separate self, but they're, they need us, they need this shape to, to take a, to take a, to take a, to take their, their shape. They, yeah. And it, again, I, it's funny. I keep, I keep thinking, what am I talking about? It's really interesting. We're in, in territory that's hard to talk uh, about. Well, for me, it's, it's resonating and I, I feel like I know what you're talking about. So, uh, <laughs> That's yeah. good. <laughs> um, it require you know, we, we opened talking about listening, and I think it just, uh, you know, there's so many different ways to listen, and I'm just listening through, trying to listen with my body, to be yes. honest. Just, just yes, yes, you know, yes. not parsing every single word for its, you know, logical flow, but just, you know, Beautiful, listening yeah. word by word, and it's resonating and, and carrying forth, so hopefully that's yeah. happening. <laughs> And I think it is happening. Well, that's, that's lovely because, you know, I think part of what we suffer in our culture is this sort of tyranny of rational mm -hmm. thought yep. that, you know, you need to, like right now when I say I don't know what I'm talking about, it's because I can feel that I'm not necessarily being very rational. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's so lovely that you say, well, it's fine because I'm not listening with my rational ears. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of feeling what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that's more the realm of of the body of yeah i'll pu i'll put a, a rational warning at the beginning of this episode and i'll say warning <laughs> yes. do not listen with your rational brain <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah cuz i yeah but we see this so much in our culture too this you know need to to pull things apart and take someone down and you know take apart their argument and yeah. invalidate them um you know it's just like yeah. it's just not it doesn't serve us you know it, it's some Obviously, at some points it's needed, but it's just um, yeah, it's just not 
Um, well, it's just one mode, and if, yeah. if it becomes the prevailing mode, it's, it sucks everything dry. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I think another group that, you know, I, I'm not speaking from my personal experience here of of, of what I experienced, but I, I do wonder too when we talk about embodiment, if if people that have disabilities or limitations in their bodies or non-typical bodies, but also old age and sickness. So you know, I at some point hopefully I'll be old. I'll have old age and I'll have a body that doesn't work as well, and maybe it's in pain yeah. or you know sickness. You know, yeah. how can we continue that embodiment or welcome people who who have difficulty with their bodies to to go on this journey of of embodiment? Mm. Mm, that's an interesting question. I mean, the first thing that came to me is that I mean, I know for myself as I I'm getting I'm at that junction in late fifties menopause, definitely aging, and it's it's it is um, an invitation to well. It's, you, you can see that the body is changing and mortality and, you know, the mortality of the body. And so it is an invitation to continue to, I don't know, to, to flow with the body and, and not fix the body as a thing that is, needs to look a certain way and behave, not to have a mechanical identity with a body. Um, so I, I guess with people who have different bodies, perhaps they have done that, or actually they have something to teach us because perhaps they had to really, really sort of recognize something about that, mm. that, that, that experience that the body is, is not something we control. Like I have a nephew who had cancer when he was a tiny child mm. and he lost his pro prostate and he has a external bladder and he and then he's had difficulties all his life other other things and you, i can tell he has a body image and a relationship to his body that's that includes the death of the body like and i can't tell you more about that but there's a f i feel like he has something to teach me not me mm -hmm. teach him it's as if he had he had already understood something um yeah, but I'm wondering what 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 makes you ask the question, Michael? Is is it something you encounter in your work, or? Well, no, it's that I fear that sometimes you know, again with spirituality or or yoga, that there's this projected image of a of, a, of the perfect body. Perfect body. That wow. that that's the gateway, or that's the goal to get towards. If you know you, you know you need to work out more or become more fit, and then you can really experience the, the, the totality of what yoga has to offer just as an example well, that's so such a misunderstanding yeah. of both the yoga and body you know it's that's the cult of youth the cult of beauty the cult you know the uh, because we identify with the body and and the body then the body needs to be a perfect body you know it's sort of simplistic way we mm -hmm. We, we all have, we, we fall into that trap and the culture is so good at the culture, the spiritual culture, the, 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 the whole of the culture is so good at feed, feeding us back mm -hmm. uh, sort of the myth of, of eternal youth. And, you know, you see your friend who's 50 and you go, oh, you look so young, as if, as if looking young was really important, you know, like as if, wh how about looking our age? Is that okay? No. It's not okay in our culture. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, I think, is something we all have to, I don't know, if we want to face and explore. And uh, I mean, I, I, I definitely know that's been a big part of my journey because mm -hmm. I was very uh, in love with being a pretty girl mm -hmm. and a thin pretty girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then, you know, then there were lots of goodies out there that guaranteed that you stayed a thin, pretty girl and that the culture would recognize you as such. And um, and you could be a spiritual thin, pretty girl. Mm. And you could be... <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, I think that the key is that when you sit and listen to the body, 
rather than look at the body in a mirror, when you listen to the body, it's a whole different body that you're coming in mm. touch with. It's a, it's a living body. It's a body of sensation. It's it's constantly changing shape. Yeah. It's it's connected to its environment. It's not a body that's isolated. It's you when you touch your body like that. When you listen to your body, you're also listening to the earth on which this body is standing or sitting and the space or the air that's extending beyond the body, it's not dead, inert stuff. You begin to feel. It takes time. Yeah. But And then I think, then healing is, is not being impeded, you know, like, and your body becomes the body it's meant to be with. And there are all sorts of bodies. Mm -hmm. They're not just thin, <laughs> thin yogic bodies. Yeah. Yeah, it's a but I think we have to be honest, uh, just to finish, I think we have to be honest here and recognize a big shadow around the body. And I think we, many, many of us have that perfectionist addiction to perfection with our bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really important to recognize it and to bring compassion there, not to judge that and to see that something deeply wrong with our culture, deeply wounded in our culture, it's it's the it's a culture of matter, you know. Everything is concrete. It's matter. So the body, it's the same. It's a thing. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is eat this way and do the twenty day blah 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 <laughs> challenge. And <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I you know it, it would probably be a whole different conversation to sort of dive into where does it, where does this come from? Um, but I think. If, for me right now, I'm thinking it has something to do with the fear of death and it's just the way that we manifest getting old age, sickness and death that we, we somehow think Absolutely. making the perfect body into a god or a goddess to worship and try to become like is, is just a, a way to, um, to run away from. But that's right. But you, I think you've got the cause. It's a fear of death. But yeah. Because when you connect with the real body, it, it puts you in touch with death. Because mm -hmm. it's constant. There's const, It's it's like nature. So yeah, yeah. And I think when again, like maybe in traditional societies or still in indigenous places, they. Well, I don't want to idealize or create some kind of, but I think there were rituals and myths and just lifestyles that where you were never disconnected from. From the reality of death, of aging, of sickness, of yeah. smells, and mm -hmm. I don't know, just just the prime primal life, primal, yeah. Yeah, elemental, scary. You know, I think <laughs> it's scary life because it's so out of control and. Yet it isn't because there are these invisible laws, but it's so out of the ego's control. It's terrifying. So let's become a Barbie doll <laughs> by all means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a it, bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're the sponsor of this episode. So no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to edit that out. <laughs> just <joking>. Don't. <laughs> I think those are the best parts. <laughs> I was also wanting to somehow in in our conversation the idea of devotion for me has been very important yeah. in my journey yeah. not the idea the experience mm -hmm. and yet I, I don't know where it fits in but it's sort, sort of something to do with the there is a human being there and a mystery even though I know that my reality and your reality and God's reality is the same reality and I know there's only one being, and I know that I, the I that I am, is ultimately awareness. I've never ceased to feel often the awe or the 
desire to get down on my knees or the sort of childlike relationship to the great unknown. And I, I, I feel that's also part embedded in listening to the body, mm -hmm. to, to, to life. It puts you in correct relation. Something about, like you also said, like illness, aging, all that, and being with it. And it, it's humbling, you know. And it's, it puts you in, in the correct place. You know, we are going to die. Yeah. Each one of us. Mm -hmm. And we won't have understood everything with, with, with our minds. We, but we'll have touched it. Yeah. And known it. And in, I don't know. Like, mm. so mysterious. Yeah, perhaps there is also, you know, what's, talking a lot about society today, but um, there's a fear of devotion, too, in our society. You know, there's people in, in spiritual circles, too, they, they like to take out the devotion, you know, like secular Buddhism, you know, let's yeah. take out the bowing and the all the reverence stuff. I know, stuff I know. Because it makes us feel uncomfortable. And it's like, why is that? Why? Well, also... Yeah, why is that? Good question. I hear sometimes, you know, like now, you know, with the non-dual teaching, it's, 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 you've, we've taken away all the, you know, the Sanskrit, this and that, and it's much better, it's more direct, it's more clear, it's more, I, I never, I think there's a, it's, I can get sometimes that some of, some of the traditions, religious tradition, that some of the tr religious decorations can be a bit, a bit, Bit much sometimes, but definitely not the devotional aspect or the like you said the bowing, yeah. the the things that our bodies actually do naturally when we let our bodies move. You know, in med in meditation, you know those mudras or those gestures of like the, putting your hands in a prayer mudra, they they just they are natural. They they come to us, bowing, putting your head down on the floor getting on your knees, those are archetypal movements. They, they're embedded in, in, our, in us. Yeah. And, and they, they, they're so beautiful. You know, I think some of us love going to Asia or to India because it's still, it's still visible that. Yeah, it's still, and it, it maybe activates in us that ancient part of us that, that recognizes and sees that it's okay and it's, it's natural, like you said, to, to bow to the divine, to, to not see ourselves as the complete whole, well, to see ourselves both as the complete wholeness of perfection, but also the imperfection that's, that's um, evolving towards something that's, that's incomplete. Wholeness, exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And does mm. does devotion present itself for you in a particular way, like in a daily way? That any practices that you? No, I don't have a. No, no, I'm not very good at practices. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's just because it's me. I I'm not very disciplined, and so, so it it presents itself more spontaneously. Mm -hmm. I I think, where sometimes I will light incense, a candle, and I have my favorite saints. You know, they're Indian. Mm -hmm a couple and um or it will be just a spontaneous feeling that will arise mm -hmm. um and but now more and more I'll I'll put my body in a certain devotional posture you know I I will sit or kneel or I I let my I I let I let myself go there fully mm -hmm. um and I regret I I regret often not living in a culture where I can go to a shrine that's ancient and saturated with smells and uh, with with a you know a deity that has been beloved and anointed for centuries and that you it's less easy in our culture. I mean, you can go in churches sometimes, chapels where the silence is nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but. Um, you know, in in, the, in my groups, I, I you know I think they're quite devotional. Mm -hmm. But just because I don't know why, just because. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree, and I'm glad you brought this up because I also feel like it's something lacking in my own practice in my own life. Like if I'm in the context, mm -hmm. if I'm at like a on a, a retreat at a at a monastery, and 
you know, we bow we, when you walk into the Buddha three times. Like I'll do that, but somehow yeah. it's not a part of my of my daily life or or something that I think about. You know, um, the, the the act of, of devoting myself. Yeah. But yeah, no, I hear you, Michael. Um, but I'm coming back to the body and to listening to the body. To mm -hmm. me, if when I sit and listen to the body, I do have to sort of evoke something about devotion. I, I can't say how I... It's, it's like I, if I don't see the act of listening to my experience and to the body, if, if I don't feel that to be an act of devotion, then it becomes a little bit mechanical. Mm. I don't know how to say it, though. I can't say it. it, it I ha Sometimes if I guide a meditation, it's coming out of my yeah. direct experience. It's this feeling of that, first of all, we came together. Like Christ, you know, said, when two or more gather, I will be there. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that feeling when a group gathers to contemplate. Already there's something happening in the field. And to me, that's devotion. That, that's the field. We've created a field where we are turned back towards the, my the mystery and and then and then that means that when we turn towards the body towards listening we're doing it as almost like a pr it's almost like a prayer or mm. even though it's not wanting anything or looking for anything it's we're in the shrine we're in the shrine mm. um, I'm not secular I don't think I think I'm quite a religious person mm -hmm. <laughs> or mm -hmm. Yeah, I am too. I went to Catholic school for 12 years. Uh, I'm not a practicing <laughs> Catholic, but it's in my DNA to be <laughs> to be yeah. religious and reverent. But, but I think, yeah, and I think each, you know, that Christian tradition is, is in our blood, some of us, I mean, not everybody, and mm -hmm. it it's not nothing, it's something beautiful that can inform our our ways. Yeah, there's something about, you know, as a child, I was basically taught to believe in magic, <laughs> you know, like Jesus, yeah, Jesus is exactly. watching you, he's in your heart, he walked on water, he turned water into wine. And like, this was taught right aside, right next to my science class in, in first grade, you know? And so... Uh, same here. Yeah, so I have a, a reverence and a place of, of wonder, and, and I'm able to look at something like consciousness or... Um, you know, I'm able to look up in the in the stars, and part of it feels like magic to me. Still, you know, existence is magical. Mm -hmm. So, I'm very grateful mm -hmm. for for my, you know, I'm not grateful for everything in the Catholic tradition, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously a lot of, not. Yeah, a lot of not so pleasant <laughs> things that uh, can come right. up with within these traditions. But um, for for the um, yeah. for reverence and awe, I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and I, I like that we're um, kind of closing here, talking about listening, and I want to be mindful of of your time, and uh, I'm really yes. uh, grateful for this conversation and for being in conversation with you. And uh, yeah, we anytime you want to come back and talk, I'm I'm happy to talk again. So. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're lovely to talk with Michael. So thank you. Thank you. And. Um, yeah, I did. You know, I did. I don't want to neglect. Um, do you do you have anything that you wanted to maybe mention, like upcoming things? We'll probably release this kind of soon, like within the next few weeks. So if you have any kind of like events or uh, web, anything really that you well, want. I have. A, I have a little retreat coming up in England. So I, you know, if if anybody's in England or in in Europe, it's in March and it's on my website. It's just three days mm -hmm. and it should be very lovely. Cool. Otherwise, weekly webinars all on my website, and everyone welcome. Um, yeah. Nice. All right, we'll have links to all that in the notes, the show notes. Thank you, Michael. Yep. Very nice. All right, well, thank you, Alan. It was great to speak with you. And okay. Until next time. <laughs> yeah. Bye, Michael. Thanks again. And thank you for listening to The Sounds of Sand. We invite you to explore more of our talks, dialogues, videos, articles, events, and offerings through our website, scienceandnonduality.com. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of SAND content, available exclusively to SAND members, 
And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify. And share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well.